Welcome everyone to the stand up meeting for April 12th. This is Open Research Institute's meeting on FPGA work. And we talk about what we've done over the past week, what we're going to be doing over the next week, if we have any roadblocks, or if we need any resources. Uh, so, so go ahead, Paul, uh, you have the floor first. Eek. Okay. Um, what do I have to report for the remote lab? Not too much is going on. It still seems to be running slower than it ought to, and I don't know why. So if anybody has any inspirations into what I should check or investigate, then I would welcome them. Uh, otherwise, I've been working on various uh, things with you that you can cover, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to uh, shortchange your efforts to try to address the uh, what we perceive to be as performance problems in launching applications and tools. Uh, so we we did battle a, a strange thing with the swap file yesterday, and we have some ideas on that. So um, just for, for everybody to know that we're working hard on, on making sure that the computer that runs all the VMs that's attached to the hardware is going to run as fast as it possibly can. Um, so that's uh, that's something that's going on. All right, back to you. I think that's all I have. Okay, yeah, no roadblocks or resources needed for remote labs? Not that I've identified. Okay, uh, I know that the Remote Labs South um, technician uh, is expected to join us today. We're looking forward to him coming on board. That um, is essentially the same set of equipment that we have in Remote Labs West, which is here in San Diego. So the, uh, the goal is to get a parallel set of equipment up and running. Um, we have uh, lots, there's lots of things going on behind the scenes to get that to work. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that lab uh, director joining us on the meetings moving forward. The, the work that's done there may be uh, related to what we're doing. It, it gives us some more options for equipment, um, but the goal is to, uh, to try to find uh, projects uh, that, that really need open source FPGA support. So it could end up being very different. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. It's been a, a, quite the week. Uh, let's see, next on the list here is Leonard. You have the floor. Uh, let's see here. I'd like to actually do a, a demo, but it could fail. Um, and because of that, uh, is there any way I could go last? Of course. Yeah, and I've set it to where everybody can share. So if you have something to screen share, that should work. And I will I'll put you uh, at the bottom. No problem. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Everest, you have the floor. Yeah, maybe Shuto could um, explain what he did in the weekend first, and uh, then I, I can uh, speak about that. Okay, no, pro no problem. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Swato. Yeah, so we had tested uh, like fixed conf configuration, uh, and what we changed the, today was, or recently was, um, essentially Im embedding the um, like the using the first word of a, a a frame an access stream frame to extract the config from. So you know you can change stuff on the fly. Uh, there was a few errors. Uh, <laughs> and I, 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 there's there are still a few errors. Uh, so Everest actually worked around one. Uh, well, yeah, a couple of errors that you know I, I have to fix some stuff on the FPJ side, <laughs> but uh, I think overall it, it looks like it's working. Um, I, I mean, it's like um, a like a happy path, or you know, when everything you know stars align, <laughs> you know, uh, the thing works. Uh, I just need to fix like. Uh, there's some width conversion that is wrong, you know, it, it there's some issues that is to need to address for the thing to be uh, robust. But 
So for now, it is actually you know, results that Everest has been getting um, are actually quite quite good, actually. Excellent. No, I, I understand what you mean. Uh, do, is there any resources that you need or, or anything that we can help with? Uh, I think so at this point, I think the, the, the ZC706 would be nice, but uh, um, Anshu is still is working on that. Like I, I would like to have the card working <laughs> like Pluto does because the FPGA is bigger. So it's easier to add ILAs and debug some you know weird stuff that I don't see in SIM. Um, but I think that's gonna come with time. Okay. Yeah, understand. Yeah, the transition from the X. So this is, uh, I'd like to make sure that everybody knows that this is not an either or thing. This is both and like the, the work done on the Pluto actually has is very exciting and, and hugely useful. We do know and, and acknowledge that the FPGA is relatively small for the sorts of things that we're trying to do. Um, but it's extremely exciting to get so much utility out of this platform. And because so many people have a Pluto, I think the goal should be to let people use their Pluto and, and enable yeah. these functions with this code. I mean, it's extremely exciting and so so worth doing. Um, so it's not, a, it's not in conflict, uh, but we also want to take what we've learned with the Pluto and get working, and what's working on the Pluto and then get it working on the on the 706, on the ZC 706. And then, yeah, it's a much larger uh, FPGA, so. Yeah, um, Everest set up a fork of analog devices, the HDL repository um, and put together, uh, essentially you, you can clone the repository um, and make all in the specific folder and it should, and it builds the, you know, the bitstream for Pluto. Like there is no more, you know, passing around the zipid, the compressed project with, you know, modify files that are not on the repository, and, you know, things like that. So good. It, it, yeah, that's yeah. excellent. Being able to being able to use the, the reference de design from analog devices is a big win. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay, is all right. So anything? Is there anything else that you need or that you're concerned about? No, no, not really. Okay. Yeah, I know we have had. Uh, so on the particular, the Pluto is attached to Karapi, the virtual machine, um, one of the virtual machines that we have in Remote Labs West, and we also have this large ultra scale, um, really big dev board, the the ZCU one hundred six. Um, and so we had to learn over the past week that like the hardware server doesn't just automatically help you. Um, so what we might do is separate the, you know, separate the two, um, or we'll figure out a way to to share the the hardware resources. The the friction, I guess this is my report. Okay, so I'm working on um, HDL coder from from MATLAB, which is a a really neat toolbox that lets you take MATLAB scripts, turn them into HDL, and then put them to work for you in uh, FPGA in the loop validation verification process. Um, so you, you, what you have to do is you have to write a test bench and you have to write a, you know, your IP and then get it to all match up well. Uh, and you, you do have to still use Vivado. It's called as a command line option. And that's where the problem kind of came up is that MATLAB and the HDL coder, there doesn't seem to be any way to do anything else other than use the default hardware server. So if you, if you have multiple instances of hardware like we do, then, well, it's just going to look at the default, uh, at the default port. So uh, it, we spent some time trying to figure that out, which is good because as a remote labs, we need to be able to field these sorts of things. And the, the, probably the best solution is to split off into another VM and have each VM that individuals use dedicated to a particular set of hardware. Uh, but we, we did actually get it to work, um, you know, by, by shutting down hardware servers and switching over. And so just the 106 is targeted by, by this workflow. Uh, and now we've run into a different roadblock in that 
from Vivado, I can take this bitstream that MATLAB created and program the, the ZCU 106 just fine. It programs great. But from HDL Coder, from MATLAB, it doesn't. It throws a weird error. So there's something still wrong, but we've eliminated the contention, the hardware contention problem. So this is properly, uh, you know, should be should be classed as a remote labs access problem and not an FPGA IP development problem. So pro progress is is moving forward for the uplink uh, HDL development. Uh, we'll eventually integrate that into all of this wonderful progress on the downlink and put them together for for a demo. The, there is another issue that I should bring up with the the MATLAB script for M17 for our the M17 protocol is what we're using on the uplink. We're not convinced that it's right yet. So we, we're looking at the spectrum results from MATLAB and it seemed to be way wide, uh, much wider than the than, than the bandwidth expected. The bit rate's 9600 right now and we're, we are going to expand that for space for five gigahertz. But what we're using right now is the VHF UHF version of, of M17 and the script is not really looking like what we expected when we really drill down. So, so there may be some some work yet on on correctly translating the protocol into MATLAB, which then is, you know, carried through to HDL. Um, anyway, that's that's my report on on what I've been up to, and uh, the floor is open for 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 comments, questions, and uh, future work. Yeah, so maybe can I, can I sum up uh, what we did uh, on the last uh, week? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so first we uh, validate that the uh, design with the fixed mod code is okay, which means that I fork uh, the analog device HDL for the Pluto and fork it to uh, integrate the DBS2 encoder. So with that, it's easier to uh, replicate it on uh, Kerapy, for example. Um, after that, uh, we discuss with Shoto that uh, the metadata, which means that how to reconfigure uh, the mod code is easier if it is interleaved in the data itself. So as Shoto explained, it is <clears throat> one word uh, just before one BB frame. Um, and uh, that's quite easy to synchronize. And uh, it is on the, on the same uh, philosophy of uh, analog device and uh, it's very well it's easier for me to uh, uh, well to uh, to send uh, different parameters with uh, these techniques uh, right now yeah we have uh, we can uh, set different mod code um, for the uh changing there is some issue i think again with some uh, maybe um uh, some aligned or something like that i think that should have to uh, to work a little on that um but it's for me a very good starting uh because i can uh, easily uh, integrate all that and develop the uh, the arm uh, side of all that. Um, the next step will be to generate the BB frame from a transport stream, which is not very complicated, I think. Uh, next, uh, uh, have a DBB GSE uh, integrated in the BB frame. For that, uh, the receiver, uh, because right now the the, the main uh, tool for uh, analyzer is uh, the, the tune, the mini tune, 
and um, but we need maybe to have uh, the deck tech uh, card deck tech receiver card running. Uh, I speak with my colleagues and uh, we need to implement it with the deck tech API. Um, and I see that there is um, a Wireshark uh, DVBG SE um, uh, parser, which is uh, just uh, a new, uh, well, you, you just have to send a BB frame over UDP uh, and uh, Wireshark could uh, disencapsulate all that. So uh, the, the goal is to have the DT API from DECTEC uh, sending, uh, well, uh, extract the BB frame and then sending uh, over UDP. So I don't know if anyone want to uh, try to do that. It could be very helpful. Um, the other um, way is to uh, try to uh, modify the code, not from uh, Minitune, but uh, from the long mine, which is a Linux based uh, controller for the Minitune. Uh, to accept BB frame. This is another work, but it's uh, not trivial. So there is a lot of work, but uh, all is uh, very exciting uh, because, uh, well, it's working uh, already over the year. Back to you. Well, thank you so much. So, uh, so Paul, would you like to comment a little bit on the GSE in Wireshark. Sure. I actually have done some work on that uh, Wireshark plugin, added some features that we needed um, earlier on in the process. So I'm familiar with the Wireshark plugin. Uh, and it probably does do what you would need uh, for what you were describing. I think that would be a good idea. I've only started to brush the surface of the DT API. So I don't know how much work is involved in the DTI to DT API to UDP adapter, but that would be an interesting thing. Uh, I don't want to grab this job and uh, keep other people from working on it, but I might take a look at it and see what I can, what progress I can make quickly. Well, thank you. It'd be appreciated. All right, uh, floor is open for any sort of other comments. I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear from, from everybody if they have anything to say, uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, planned demonstrations. Okay, so the next couple of opportunities for us to demonstrate work, um, which is, which is really our strength uh, to, to actually show working hardware and software and firmware, um, and then publish everything as we go. We have a, a talk with IEEE coming up on the 4th of May, and this is in San Diego. It's in person and virtual, and it focuses on the M17 forward error correction, but also error correction and, uh, and techniques and our FPGA progress. So this is a, a sort of a floor show along with a talk and also citing work done by uh, Andre and Everest uh, and potentially uh, Leonard and, and all of us that have been working on this all along. So, so it's one of the many times where we just simply show what we do. And that has been a very good um, sort of a technique for us uh, to, to simply show what we do. So if you can possibly help with getting uh, the something working over the air for the for May 4th yeah, here in San Diego, that would be wonderful. Now this is a, a relatively small uh, group. So it's a chapter meeting of IEEE uh, and not a not something like a conference like IMS 2023, which we're we're also looking at participating in. The big demonstration where we really want to have as much working as possible is in August, mid-August in 
uh, Las Vegas, Nevada in, in the United States at DEF CON. And uh, I believe we also have uh, a variety of people that are going to be able to represent us at a, at a very large event in Friedrichshafen. That is a large amateur radio event in Europe. And we have a, a booth, a, an exhibit uh, for M17 and for OpenRTX uh, related project that we help and support. And they are going to talk about the, uh, the M17 protocol, which it's two things. It's, it is our, our chosen digital uplink protocol for, for space and for the transponder, but it's also a VHF UHF voice protocol for two meter ham radio. Um, you have VHF, UHF, ham radio. So anything that anyone can do in order to participate at Friedrichshafen, uh, the SDR forum at Friedrichshafen is actively looking for, for presentations. And we have multiple people that have expressed an interest in presenting at Friedrichshafen. We will support you as much as we possibly can. I will not be able to travel to, to it, unfortunately, this year. Um, but we would really like to show the work and to to invite, uh, you know, also to pre present the work and say, look at the amazing things we're doing, and also invite people to to join and to uh, to contribute uh, and give us feedback to tell us which directions they're most interested in. Uh, so, so those are the things that are happening um, in the near term, uh, locally and also uh, internationally over the summer towards the autumn. Um, the, the reason that we emphasize demonstrations so heavily is that it's very hard to argue with working hardware and software. And that that establishes a solid platform in order to, to move forward and to uh, make our, our project uh, much more likely to be picked for space missions. So that's the, that's the plan. That's the, the overall thing. Uh, I'm all in on making this happen. So if there's anything that you need or there's a place that you want to present your work, let me know. And we will do all that we can to make that a, a very enjoyable and productive experience. Okay, any, any comments, questions, or discussions that we need to have? I have one. Go ahead. Um. Getting back to the question of uh, getting GSE into Wireshark, there actually is a way that we already have. Uh, we have the IECA SR1 receiver, which does GSE over DBBS2. And it already knows how to output these uh, UDP frames that Wireshark takes in. In fact, that's how we developed the, or how I made the slight small changes to the Wireshark. Okay. Uh, the plug-in, I forget what they call them. Um, so that could be put up in the remote lab and used very quickly to, uh, to receive GSE and, and get it out to where we can look at the bits. That might be, it would certainly be easier and would probably be quicker. Uh, it would be an, at least another reference point for correctness of GSE. Is there, am I missing something? Is there some reason why the DT API gets us uh, more than that? Yeah, that's that sounds good. I think that uh, the, the deck tech is uh, really needed when we want to uh, test the DBS 2X extension. Uh, until that, if, there is all the uh, cards which are already uh, validated uh, receiving the DBBGAC is very, um, well, it could be very convenient to, uh, to have a reference on that. And uh, I don't know if the, the card you mentioned is uh, DBBS2X but um, it's a very good starting point. I don't remember whether it does S2X or not. Do you remember, Michelle? Uh, I'd be hesitant to say. I think that it 
that's the why we picked it was or actually i think we picked it mainly because of gse and we should we should go yeah. look and then talk about it um on on slack and the mailing list so yeah we'll report back i think that it does and that's why we got it but it's been a while gse was the the critical thing yeah gse yeah. was new in those days and s2x i think was still in the future yeah, relatively new. Uh, it was. I I think it does, but we'll we'll check. And if not, you know, the, we'll end up with a Venn diagram. When you when you prove out one thing at DBBS two, um, you then you then re, you end up relying on the extension being um being able to work with the extension. So so what we'll do is we'll we'll go and double check. I think it does, but that's just a vague memory. Okay, I'm looking at the SR one. Uh web page now and they do not brag about s2x so i'm guessing okay. that okay so let's just assume that gse works for tvbs2 on the on the iaca sr1 pro yeah they have a new product called the sr8 which does s2x is it a box or is it a can you tell if it's a box or if it's like a rack mount gear it's a 1u rack mount okay yeah, we were we were able to, the SR1 Pro is a, a box and relatively inexpensive. There was a, a charge that that we had to pay in order to enable the GSE. Um, but the the rack mount gear, they they sort of transitioned as a company to a much more expensive test equipment. So that's I, I believe that's what you're looking at there. However, what we can do is give a uh, it's a piece of test equipment that does GSE uh, for DBBS2, and that's what we can uh, potentially add to the, the lab. It's uh, a really good idea. Yeah, we, we can uh, validate the S2X waveforms using the, uh, the deck tech boards, validate the GSE using the SR1, and it right. makes validating both together to much less urgent, although we still need to do it. Um, so we have more time to develop, say, a DT API solution for the. For okay. The yeah, that's a, a very understandable um, approach. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and try to do that then. Um, we'll, we'll write it up. It'll be, we'll have, you know, and we'll, we'll post it to see if there's any, if anyone else has uh, that's on the project has some input. Um, but that sounds like a pretty good division of, of validation to me. And it's equipment yes. we already have. It's, it's stuff that we already, we don't need to purchase anything or, uh, you know, it, it is work of course to add things to the lab, but it, but it sounds like a good approach to me. I think we're still missing a component though, if I'm not mistaken, um, both the deck tech board and the, the SR1 expect to get RF. Uh, so we need to integrate our encoder with an actual radio. Okay, we have that with the ADRV 9371 and we have it with the Pluto. Okay, and that's, those are working. We've actually, uh, gotten all the way to RF with those platforms. Yeah, I'll defer to the, the people actually working on it, um, you know, but but creating RF ap appears to have been done. So I'll I'll stand by for folks to to talk about that. Yeah, from what Everest mentioned, I think, yes. I, okay. I don't know, maybe he so, has, he looped like with um, a wire or you know, something like that. But fr from what I understood, uh, you know, you, you could, you could have, I don't know, two plute or, you know, another equipment. Um, it is at that stage, yeah. If, if it's not RF, you could go RF um, quickly from what I understood. Yeah, I'd okay. like to get I'd like to get there as quickly as possible for a variety of reasons. To for me, the the fundamental reason is that if it if it can work over a an air over an air over the air, then 
you're forcing yourself to do all of the functions. And when you do a loop back or when you're doing a simulation, yeah. then you, you, you always end up, even if you don't know it or if you aren't aware of it, there's there's always something that's that's giving you leverage. When you do it over the air, it forces you to do everything, synchronization all the way down, to, you know, everything has to be right. And it's a much bigger win. And that's that's one of the reasons why I push so hard for over the air demos and, and working over the air. So if we're if we're there, which it seems like we are, uh, this is a huge step forward and and very good news. So for uh, you you were talking about the VBS two X, uh, the encoder do, like it doesn't do S two X. Right. Yeah, I, we know. I, I know. Yeah. I yeah, know there yeah, are no, some no, differences no problem. from yeah. the spec. There are, there are. You're right. Yeah, not yet. It's 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 good. DVBS two, great. You know that's uh, okay. not not a we're not disappointed. <laughs> Eventually, yeah, no, we no, definitely <laughs> want to do DVBS two X because we mm -hmm. we suspect that the a lot of stations that are going to be using our system are going to have to take advantage of the extension in the low SNR range, and. Honestly, okay. if we if we are able to field a system that does DBBS 2X, then we can also provide solutions for the high throughput satellite scene that they may actually use this because uh, those extensions are are were much more critically needed uh, for mm -hmm. for HTS. So, all right, I think Everest was. Uh, I, I saw I saw him unmute, so I'm I'm going to turn it over to him. Yeah. <clears throat> So yeah, of course we are we are in over the air right now because it's just the output of the Pluto RF uh, RF output uh, going into the Minitune RF. So we are over the air. Um, what could be also very interesting is that uh, we clone the the HDL design um, um, on the Kerapi, and then uh, having the RF output to the spectrum analyzer could be a, a interesting thing. Well, it's already uh, um, working very well uh, in local. And uh, I just uh, validate the spectrum uh, clean uh, just with an SDR, but having a real uh, uh, spectrum analyzer could be, uh, uh, well, to fine tuning could be uh, very interesting. You want the spectrum analyzer hooked up to the Pluto or to the? Xilinx board. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, the output of the well, as soon as we <clears throat> as we can replicate exactly what I have on the Pluto locally here, uh, could be very interesting. Yeah, to uh, to have the RF output of the Pluto to the spectrum analyzer. Okay, yeah. that's easy. Yeah, that is that's relatively easy, and that would be something good to uh, bring to the IEEE presentation on the fourth of May. Uh, just, I just have, have a quick question. Uh, uh, right now, we uh, removed the polyphase filter, which is uh, very area consuming for the Pluto. And uh, as I see, you have mentioned a lot of. Uh, positive, um, well, uh, needed of this polyphase uh, filter instead of a uh, fear filter. Uh, is it, uh, is it um, uh, breaking some philosophy or can I, can we let it like that? Oh, no, um, you can, the, so the, the multi-rate processing techniques or the polyphase filter bank, um, that's something that really needs to be in the satellite in order to receive many, many channels in FDMA. So in terms of like a point-to-point -point 
communications, uh, like uh, Leonard is interested in doing uh, for for a demo, uh, a point to point demo with Pluto's that that he that he is um, is thinking about, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to have all the complexity of a uh, polyphase filter bank. I mean, if you're going to do um, a, to receive a whole large number of frequency division multiple access communications, you know, if you're thinking about the uplink being all of these stations on the Earth that all are assigned a slot in frequency, then you're going to need a polyphase filter bank in your satellite. Yeah. And and so for for you as a Pluto, uh, you you know, if if you don't need to have a whole bunch of channels coming at you, then you don't need the polyphase or multi-rate processing so don't feel like you have to use that technique whatever filter works in order to make the transmission happen and a re and a reception a point-to-point -point reception happen then use that technique um, yeah okay as, because as i understand the polyphase uh filter is very convenient for multiple uh receiving bank but if you uh, gen, uh, if you generate a whole transponder, which is a WBS two X, uh, then on the transmit side you don't need that and right. just have a fear filter, right? Right. Yes, you don't need that okay. on the correct. You're exactly right. Yeah. The the, okay. the our polyphase or the, our multi rate techniques are for manipulating a, a a ten megahertz, hopefully a ten megahertz wide uplink band at five gigahertz and all of these signals might be coming at you. So you need to have something um, flexible, remarkable, and, and you know, multi-rate techniques and the polyphase filter can be, that is, we think the best solution for that problem. But that's not something that you have to have with the Pluto at all. So, so you're on the right track, um, you know, and we have, <laughs> We have plenty of work to do with a uh, with multi-rate processing uh, of the uplink, and there's some some beautiful and remarkable work that we'll be able to do. Uh, but that does not have to go into the Pluto. Okay, right. My uh, basic DSP is uh, okay, right? Oh, it's not <laughs> just well, it's, it's beyond okay. It's it's wonderful. So so yes, you're you're. You're exactly right on the right track, and do not feel bad in any way uh, for, you know, saying nope, that's not me. <laughs> <It's> not... <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have any um, any presentations? Um, does Does anybody need any support with either presentations of their work or publishing or anything? Any ideas for uh, any place that they want to demonstrate? Um, and if so, uh, either we can talk about it now or 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 let me know and i'll help out because one of the goals is to to make sure that everybody gets lots of credit and is, is and, and their work gets gets shown and shared um we've gotten um we've 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 been able to to take advantage of some excellent opportunities uh, and their feedback has been very, very positive. So the, I'd like to, to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to publish and to present wherever they like. Uh, so to just keep it in mind. If there's anything that anybody needs help with, let me know. I, I can put together, um, I don't know, slides or, you know, something. Um, I, uh, you can, you, you, Michelle, can you put in the, in, in Slack the, you mentioned IEEE, DEFCON, and a third. Mm -hmm. Just put, I don't know, the dates link, you know, because I, I, I tried to write down, but. Um, yeah, I know. I get it. Yeah. yeah. If it wasn't for Google Calendar, there's not, I would do nothing. Um, yes, I will. Yeah. It's it. I'll, I'll add it to the, um, our little, our weekly report, and I'll also put it in Slack. Um, cool. The, the, the big events that are, that are coming up for us where we have the best, what I think might be the best opportunity. And in longer term, the IMS, the International Microwave Symposium from IEEE uh, is coming up in 2023. This will be the summer of 2023. So quite a while. Uh, but as you know, IEEE has long lead times for, for submitting. Uh, since it's in San Diego, uh, I'm part of the um, 
so so I'm part of the volunteer team for that. And uh, amateur radio is a prominent part of IMS in IEEE. So we have some opportunities to show, uh, present, and publish. So if you if you have any sort of ambition to uh, present at an IEEE conference or be published in IEEE journals, and no, they aren't especially open access. Yes, there's lots of paywalls, um, but yeah. it is IEEE, so we have lots of opportunities to uh, to put the work. Uh, open source work and stick up for open source work at that particular conference. And since it happens to be in my hometown, I can help out um, a lot more uh, than than I would yeah. if it was for say, you know, for example, if it was in Hawaii or Jakarta or you know uh, Berlin or or New York. So so anyway, we're we are all invited um, to to apply to submit uh, work for IMS 2023. So that's the the sort of the landscape moving forward for for all of this work. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. I'm gonna have to drop. Um, oh, sure thing. Yeah, I think we'll close. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for all of your time. It's a deeply Forget appreciated. Leonard. Oh, Leonard. Hello. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, Andre. I'll uh, see you later if you need to drop. But um, uh, yeah. basically. Uh, let me share my screen and go over this. Yeah, apologies, Leonard. I, I have you written down and and uh, botched it, so my, my bad. Okay, so you should see my one of my screens right now. Yes. Um, basically, what I have is a face for ground repository here. You see here, here's the main repository for the DVBF PGA, and then I created a sandbox basically over here. Essentially, what this is is. A, we can figure out what to do with it or where to put it later. But my vision of it was, and doesn't necessarily need to be the correct one, is that it has, you know, kind of um, face for ground IP in it. And uh, the DVB2 encoder is one of them. So the idea is that uh, in here, this is what would be in the Git repo. Obviously, the archive here is not part of it. It's just, you know, there. So we have our source, whatever stuff we want to add to it. And I think that this third party, some of it could be just other pieces of IP that's parallel over here. Um, anyway, so somebody would uh, clone uh, this piece of IP into their local IP repository, go into the scripts thing here. We have a couple of scripts. Um, one sets up the environment and then the other one produces the user IP, which is different than the Xilinx IP, right? So um, I've already got a tickle screen here. It's initialized. So um, it's, yeah, so it's in that scripts directory already. So this directory right here. Um, so what, what I would do is just, um, let's see, where's that? So, uh, since it's tickle, you just source and then the tickle file, which is my, I named it just user IP tickle for this thing here. And let's see if this works. Hopefully it won't bomb on me. So it goes, uh, initially removes, uh, yeah, look at this. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. There's, a. Yeah. I, uh, there's a, so let's see here, uh, project. Um, yeah, so there, uh, I did have a, I need to fix something in the script where it automatically detects if a project's open or closed, and if it does, it just close it. Um, so let's run it again. Um, so the first thing is, is you give it the part that you're working on. That would be the user's part, whatever they're using, um, or, uh doesn't necessarily need to be because once it's an ip you can suck it into whatever and it goes and creates the ip so now it's done um and if we go into the dvb coder has created the xilinx artifacts these three folders right here it's also created the component xml that you put in and then the gui the x gui folder and that just has the wrapper tcl for the component so now you've essentially turned your source code into 
a piece of IP that you can just plop down into a design. Okay, so of course you wouldn't do this unless you had a design open. So I already have this Vivado uh, for 21.2.2 uh, open for the Pluto. And if we look in here, this is just a standard Pluto design here. There's no, um, there's no DVB S2 in there. And that's what the whole reason is. But this would be the customer's design anyways, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be the Pluto. So now that you've created that piece of IP, it's in a repository. You go into um, the settings thing here. I'll open up the settings dialog box. And under IP, it says repository. Um, oh, shoot, this was already in there. But normally, that wouldn't be, it would look like this, whatever your repository is. And then you just, you, you say, you add the repository. And so you fit. If we remember, it was all the way over here and, and this guy here, which contains your GUI and the other files. So you just click on that, select, and then it adds it. You get a dialog box here to say, okay, you wanna add this in there. It recognizes that there's an encoder. You said, okay, and then okay. And then now when you hit the plus sign here to add, you, you know, all your IP cores show up, including what other user IP is. There should be ADI stuff in there, right? Um, there's an ADI Axie DMA, but we want to do the DVBS to encoder. This is the one that we just created two seconds ago. And we plop it down. There it is. Now you hook it up. That's it. Um, so that was a demo of. Uh, kind of the script that, that I worked on. So all of this here would be essentially the source, you know, the wrapped up version of um, what Andre and Everest has been working on. Um, let's see here, where's my directory that I was just had open? So uh, projects, oh, this one, I think. Yeah, so um, this script here is essentially um, pointing to the, the files that, um, well, they're here, but they can be, I've copied them here, but the script itself uh, can essentially copy over whatever is in um, the DVB at FPGA, or we could create that directory inside this thing here, whatever makes sense. I don't, I don't know what, what would make sense, but the idea is that the way I'm doing it right now is it's just, I'm playing in my own sandbox. And then um, I, I've commented this section out here, which is just an example of how to, you know, go to a directory and copy, you know, make a directory locally and copy it all over. So we can do that. Um, I'm, I just manually copied over there instead of ha having it algorithmically done. This first section here is just kind of removes, um, the previous stuff, if it exists, you know, so if, if you have something you want to just rebuild it, you just remove all the um, Xilinx um, artifacts and then just build it from scratch. Um, this here is basically a, a, a procedure that uh, Andre had already had up, I believe in his, his thing, I just reused it and then I call it, um, you know, and then down here is really my contribution to these three lines. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but anyways, it just, uh, you know, Zionist has this uh, thing that IPX package project, you tell it what it is, and, and then it'll go off and create those things. So um, there's a exa couple examples that I was using. I was, it's funny how simple this can be when, when you look in the right places. Anyways, um, I'll stop sharing now. And... Um, that's it. Uh, hopefully, um, we can figure out if we need to adjust that or use it. Or, but the flow is basically somebody wants to use a core, they can download um, either the repository or that little piece of IP, create it, and then plop it down in the design. And then yeah. at that point, you just need to hook it up. Yeah. Um, that's to, that's exactly where where we we want to go. We want to make this as easy to use as possible. And I think you've hit, um, you've, you've hit right on the nail on the head about 
about what we need to do in order to enable that. Um, and it's it's not it's not easy. I mean, you did say oh, it's as easy as this, but there's a there's an awful lot of things that need to be prepared. It's a in order to package IP and to make it available to people that are using these tools. There's certain things that you need to do, and it's a it's a definitely a, a high end sort of sort of function. So so thank you. This looks like it's really not that far off from from being something that can be delivered. Some open source work that can be delivered through. Uh, Vivado to, to somebody that wants to use the, the work in their design. Yeah, I, I think um, from a, let's say, ORI or face for ground perspective, we just need to figure out, do we want to have a, a repo that you can get cloned that's like the face for ground IP, and then um, that acts as a library of a bunch of different IPs that you can put in there, or you want each individual project, such as DVBFPJ, to have their each individual piece of IP that, that you do that to. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses to both things. You just need to decide on, you know, what makes sense and how do we want to do it, and then uh, script around that kind of framework. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like something we should start thinking about now and and talking about and see if there's a see if there's a right solution for us because um, it 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 may be to our benefit to have this to be very modular and to have each individual chunk available or uh, and it may not be an either or it may be a both and uh, to have each individual piece available but also have the entire design uh, from yeah. a very high level to be available to I know that's a lot of of work in parallel um, but we should definitely start talking about it and work towards a, a, a really a good solution that makes it easy to use the work. Yeah. And I kind of, I suppose I got some kind of inspiration from the analog devices thing, you know, loosely speaking, you know, if you look at their, you clone their HDL stuff, it's a huge library, but I mean, what they do is their, their Git uh, for ADI HDL is, there's two main directories in there. One's the library, which is essentially a collection of all their, you know, kind of interfaces for their different, you know, chipsets and stuff like that. And then the other one is a projects, which is a collection of their, let's say, um, board level type stuff where, um, or chipset slash board level type stuff where they, they pull in the IP from the library. Yeah. So if you look at that, so I was thinking that if we did something similar, yeah, um, that that in our it, it, for our example, the projects would it be equivalent to the DVB FPGA, and the library here I'm calling it P4G underscore IP. That would be like the just the IP library, and, and then when you're in the project, you just pull in you know the source or whatever. I, I don't yeah. Know. No, that's good. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah, let's keep working on this and 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 start talking about it and continue the conversation over the next week at least, and uh, and work towards uh, providing this sort of sort of level of uh, delivery. All right. Any last questions or comments before we close? Thank you, everybody. We'll meet, of course, again next week, and we'll have uh, any meetings that we need to have in the in the meantime. There's lots going on. Thank you, everyone, for making this uh, a really uh, wonderful and meaningful project. Thank you very much. Yes. Hey, you bet. Happy to help. All right, we will close and uh, see you on Slack on the mailing list and next week. Bye.